Okay, so uh, we are all here. We uh, we're gonna, going to start. So I'm going to um, make a small introduction about Coapt. Then I will um, introduce your uh, yourselves and your organizations, and um, and then I will um, ask a few questions as they have been communicated to you before. Um, and um, and yeah, you will have uh, about five minutes uh, to answer, and then we, we try to make it as dynamic as we can, if that's all right with everyone. Um, so there's no, it's not a formal presentation. It's really about answering from your experience. Um, okay, so uh, let's start. So welcome everyone to the round table around um, co-act citizen social science and civic organizations, um, what tools for what uh, results. Um, the aim of this roundtable is to um, collect the testimonies and the feedback from um, the uh, three um, members of the um, uh, COACT research project, which were selected through an open call. Um, we have Founderland, we have Women on Top, we have Single Step, three civic organizations, which were uh, selected to apply um, citizen social science methods in the context of uh, a civic organization. And uh, with us is also Stefan uh, Thomas, who is a researcher who was part of the project and supporting specifically Founderland. But let's um, take a step back and um, uh, let's um, set the, the table around COAC. So COAC stands for Co-Designing Citizen Social Science for Collective Action. This is a three-year European Union funded project proposing a new understanding of citizen social science. Um, the idea is that citizen groups sharing a social concern are recognized as experts in the field and act together with university scientists, public, administration, public administrators, and civil society organizations. So the COACT coalition, which led this um, three-year research, is formed by universities civic organizations and global networks from Spain, Germany, Austria, the United Kingdom, and Argentina. And um, COACT took the step um, of defining uh, citizen social science in a specific way in order to um, research what can be done through um, that um, um, through that research uh, field. So um, we define citizen social science as a participatory research, co-designed and directly driven by citizen groups sharing a social concern. Um, in our design, uh, we have five steps. Um, an, in an initial step that is the research and innovation preparation, uh, which is where all the preparatory steps of the research are conducted, whether it is um, defining the general outline of the research, assembling a research coalition, um, uh, um, taking care of uh, logistical planning. Uh, we have the research co-design where uh, all the research participants, so the lead researchers, the co-researchers work together to shape the research questions and refine um, ideas and solutions to any challenge that might be identified to um, deliver the research. Uh, then there's the phase where the research is actually being delivered uh, and conducted. And uh, that is followed by the collective uh, data analysis and interpretation. Um, so that all leads to a final step, which is uh, the goal of um, COACT, which is not only to uh, define what citizen social science could look like and could work, not only um, test how we um, how those five, five steps could work and actually have impact, but also transforming the research results into action. And that's the last step, the last phase of um, the research cycle as defined by the um, COACT project. Uh, but in this context, in as it has been defined, um, we are talking talking about um, research projects that are typically led by uh, research teams, academic research teams, uh, 
and they build around themselves a knowledge coalition uh, whose members include the various stakeholders relevant to the research project and which include as well uh, the citizens who are the co-researchers. This means that although there is a close collaboration uh, that is established between the researchers and the um, members of the society that are part of the coalition, the project is still an academic initiative. Um, so a part of the COAC project uh, was devoted to um, changing that framing. So what if, what if the initiative was not taken by academic researchers, but instead by um, civic organizations directly? Of course, this is not without challenge. Uh, most civic organizations do not have the experience of making use of research methods in a rigorous manner. Some do, and we have some examples here, but not all of them. Um, the uh, resources and focus of an academic research team are often very different from an advocacy focused organization. Having said that, um, the hypothesis of the COACT um, coalition and the COACT project was that uh, citizen social science methods applied to civic projects led by civic organizations uh, have the potential to increase the value of those projects, for, so civic projects for society. Um, we have a lot of examples, and, and I personally work a lot with civic organizations, uh, and we have a lot of examples of um, areas that need improvement in how civic organizations deliver projects. It, it can include faulty evidence gathering processes. It can include um, a disconnect from target communities, a lack of replicability or a lim limited reach of dissemination activities. Many of those challenges, uh, which are common to many, many civic organizations, can be partially addressed through the adoption of um, research method and especially citizen social science methods. Um, the work done by the uh, COAT consortium in partnership with our three guest um, organizations here uh, was to explore that possibility of civic organizations uh, working with marginalized or at-risk communities and being the drivers of a, a citizen social science um, project. So um, we specifically uh, as COA decided to uh, find organizations that were um, uh, from Central and Eastern Europe uh, and which had a focus as well on gender. So uh, I'm going to present those organizations here. Uh, and then we're going to um, start the roundtable with a few questions to each of them um, so that we get to um, have their feedback um, in terms of how this whole project went and how um, citizen social science, uh, what does it mean for them after having gone through this 10 months of research, 10 months of uh, project delivery using those methods. So. The first organization um, is Founderland, um, a nonprofit organization focused on building a new inclusive intersectional standard for entrepreneurs. Their work supports women of color founders navigating the entrepreneurial ecosystem and providing them with a safe space to network, share knowledge, and build their ventures. Additionally, they bring founders, allies, investors together to get more diverse, sustainable, and scalable businesses funded. Uh, Janina Vanessa Heinrich is uh, the representative here, an av advocate of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, due to exposure to the startup world through her studies and personal endeavors, she quickly realized that the entrepreneurial landscape is not a level playing field. So Yanina has made it her mission to support and create initiatives dedicated to uplifting underrepresented founders. Over the past year, she's been conducting research with Founderland uh, to foster change on, a, on both a micro and macro level. Um, not, being, not part of Founderland, but uh, working close with them is Stefan Thomas. A professor of empirical research methods at the Department of Social and Educational Science at the University of Applied Science in Potsdam. He authored 
diploma and PhD in psychology from the Free University of Berlin, and he's particularly interested in participatory, transdisciplinary, and applied research approaches conducted together with marginalized citizens. This includes a peer research project with unaccompanied min minor refugees and citizen led projects on gender inequalities. So that was um, the, the, the other two representatives of the project done uh, by Founderland. Uh, but we have also um, another organization here, uh, Single Step, um, from Bulgaria. So Single Step mission is to support, motivate, and empower LGBTI youth, their families, friends, and allies in Bulgaria for the process of recognizing, coming out, and affirming their sexual orientation and gender identity. Since its creation in 2016, uh, Single Step has managed to establish a comprehensive support program to help the community in various areas, such as psychological and legal help, peace support groups, sexual health and HIV services, advice, advice and guidance for trans people, and career support services. In 2021, they opened a community centers called The Steps, a social enterprise um, uh, under the helm of the Single Step Foundation. Um, not only it is a multifunctional venue for community events, meetings, cultural events, a peace train cafe, it's also act as a safe space for young people. And the representative from Single Step is Mom Chill, um, who with eight years of experience in the field of health as a public health expert, is also an activist and practitioner, uh, including um, the topics of HIV and AIDS. He has been devoted to research patient access and quality of care. Throughout his professional experience, he has focused on health advocacy initiatives related to policy changes, access to health care, and treatment. For five years, he was the head of the health care department of one of the largest non-governmental organizations. And over the years, he has had many responsibilities working in the fields of HIV, AIDS, including outreach work among most at-risk young people, sexual and reproductive health training, and education for young people aged. 14 to 25. So, and lastly, uh, our third organization present here, Women in SOP, um, which was an organization selected for its ability to reach um, communities across borders in Europe and especially in Greece and Cyprus. Um, so, Women on Top is a non profit organization for the economic empowerment of women and for equality in the workplace. The goal is it is to eliminate the obstacles that women encounter in their equal participation in the economy, both by empowering them and by contributing to a change in the social, labor, and political environment around them. Representing women on top is Stella. Stella is a writer, a gender expert, and the founder of Women on Top, a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, Stella has also published She's a published author, a translator, book club enthusiast, and uh, facilitates workshops on professional developments, gender issues, and social change. Um, having studied French literature in Athens, Greece, and media studies in London, she worked for 10 years as a women's magazine and online editor. So um, after, with eight books on the empowerment of girls, women, and teens, uh, she now lives in Athens with her husband, two daughters, and is part of the uh, Women on Top team. So after this um, introduction um, of our participants, I would like to uh, start asking uh, some questions. Uh, and maybe starting with um, Janina and Fondelent. And so um, we mentioned how um, citizen social science has this focus on uh, bringing together researchers, uh, citizens who are co-researchers, so who are treated as uh, equal uh, researchers in the project, um, and, and have building this knowledge coalition as well. Um, so there is a, a strong element of building a sort of research community uh, behind the concept of citizen social science. So that's Founderland, uh, which is a community-based organization, um, and you can maybe uh, quickly explain why uh, you consider yourself a community-based organization. Um, does you being this type of organization helped with adopting more easily um, sort of the logistical elements of uh, the CSS project of like working, 
identifying who could be the co-researchers and working closely with them throughout the research. That do you think that it made it easier for you or um, or not? Yeah, thank you for the question, Cedric. Um, also, thanks for having us here. It's really uh, great to be at the conclusion of this project. Um, so first thing to answer the first part of your question, Founderland is a community-based organization because as you've already mentioned, Founderland works with the women of color founders within Berlin and in Europe as a whole. And within the community, the founders themselves actually support one another in addition to the extra support that Founderland itself organizes. <laughs> And this actually worked out really well with the citizen social science methodology because the citizen social science methodology is all about empowering people who are commonly are around a particular issue or a particular topic to come together and conduct the research as well. So rather than having that traditional research approach of this kind of top-down academic researcher looking at a community, it was people from the community who have personally experienced this problems or social issues also conducting interviews and conducting research in this field. And I would say that it was actually extremely helpful for us. I think one, it's in, the research on women of color entrepreneurs in general is extremely small. Currently the research field is either on male entrepreneurship or it's always about ethnicity, but the putting the two together, gender and ethnicity is rarely everything in research. And so being able to use the citizen social science methodology allowed us to tap into an area that has been significantly under-researched. At the same time, it enabled us to empower founders within our community who are interested in making a positive change to be able to participate as co-researchers in the process. And through that, they were able then to interview other founders and hear about their experiences. And we found that it was actually extremely helpful for getting real authentic information, but also really finding out the why behind what's going on. What, what are these founders truly experiencing at the end of the day? And it's something that we believe if you were to do it a traditional research method, most likely wouldn't have come to light. So we found it extremely helpful. And I would also say that in the long run, um, the citizen social science is extremely beneficial. Um, to an organization like Founderland and other organizations because it helps us to create um, actionable um, responses to also the research as well. So I hope that answers the question a bit. Totally, thank you so much. Um, that um, I will want to actually contrast a bit your experience with uh, that of a single step um, with Momchil. So uh, Single Step is a very different type of organization. It is a, a, an organization that is close to its community uh, and it has to be uh, because there's a very strong element of trust when working with um, the LGBTI community. Um, but Single Step is also an established NGO with existing research activity, uh, with researchers in the team. And so uh, CSS comes in as uh, basically a different framing of how to apply um, research to their activity. So um, how does that transition happen for you, uh, Monshin? And what would be uh, the main challenge and the main benefits that you, you saw over the course of the project? Hello, everyone, and thank you, Cedric, for bringing us together and for the kind introduction. Indeed, uh, citizen social science has been a, a new concept to our work, to our research work. As you mentioned, we've done research previously, but this time it was different due to the uh, citizen social science approach that we implemented with your support and having uh, the community participate in, in the uh, entire cycle of our research was very beneficial for us. Just to mention for the others, the research we did was focusing on trans and non-binary people in Bulgaria, their access to the labor market and to healthcare services. Uh, so it was uh, very valuable to have the trans and non-binary people participate from the very beginning in developing the questionnaires, developing the hypothesis of the research, then carrying out the focus groups, distributing the questionnaires among the community, and at the end, br bringing everyone uh, together again to analyze the results that we got and to follow up on those results with advocacy work for changing policies on national level about access to healthcare and working with employers 
to improve visibility of trans people and their specific needs on the labor market. So in a, in a nutshell, indeed, uh, the citizen social science approach was very uh, much useful and valuable to our work. Brian, thank you for um, this testimony. Um, and I, I will uh, now switch to Women on Top, um, which has an interesting uh, also position in, in this group of three organizations. So Women on Top um, has some experience working at least with partner uh, research organization to conduct surveys, um, but does not uh, has the, the experience of single steps, so sort of uh, in the middle. Uh, but um, what's interesting with Women on Top is that um, when a uh, hundred answers uh, were considered successful with, with um, single set project, they got over a thousand answers to their question. So Women's Hub had the biggest potential number of stakeholders and for an NGO like yours, uh, which, is, um, which has a very broad uh, target, women in the workplace, um, what kind of challenges does it bring to uh, try to apply uh, citizen social science methods for your work? This is a great question, Cedric. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first, let me say that uh, applying the citizen social science uh, principle to, to this uh, project was uh, a real blessing for us and having your support was uh, an amazing opportunity for us to explore a different way to do research and to also codify some of the uh, practices that we have already been using without knowing how to call them or how to make them better. Uh, so this was a real opportunity for us and, and thank you for that. Um, we were really surprised by the response to, to our questionnaire and the, the quantitative part of our research. And for us, this was a wake up call about how long the how far the organization uh, has, uh, you know, gone over the last few years because we hadn't circulated an online questionnaire for the last three years. So it was a wake up call for us to see how this reach has changed over the years. That said, um, the whole process of the of this project um, helped us realize that quantity is not the only metric that we should be caring about uh, when we talk about research, but um, weighing a sample, weighing the population sample that responds to a survey uh, is a, a very complex uh, process when you don't work with, you know, professionals uh, and professional uh, tools, research tools. Um, it's a challenge to ensure that you have the diversity and the representativity, if, if there is such a word, uh, of, of the sample that you need in order to uh, have to, to get to the right conclusions. And I, I know there are no right conclusions, but I mean, um, some accurate conclusions that you can then generalize in order to um, reach some uh, suggestions, uh, some you know proposed actions. So uh, because our our project and our research question uh, was revolving around uh, the use of uh, new technologies and the digitization of work, this meant that, uh, the people who would answer an online questionnaire were not necessarily representative of all the women who work uh, in Greece right now and who may not be digitally literate and who may um, uh, suffer from uh, the heaviest consequences of the digitization of work. So this was a great masterclass for us on how important when your, your population sample is, and it has led us to think about how differently we can use citizen social science to ensure representation and uh, participation as well at the same time. That is very clear. Thank you, Stella. I will stay with you to ask you about the, the, the second question I had, uh, which was um, that um, 
as an organization, as partners, you were uh, among the three organizations the most vocal about making use of uh, citizen social science method in the future. So uh, you, just you just mentioned how this sort of like solidified a bit things that you were doing, but not necessarily formalizing. Uh, how do you see that being applied in the future to other projects? Is it something that you we try to disseminate it all? kind of projects or in you see some projects that are more survey based to be using uh, citizen social science how how do you see that impacting your future uh, work I would say that uh, we are planning to integrate citizen so social science in about 50 or 60 percent of our future I mean and and I mean planned work because maybe you know, on the second round of this uh, implementation, we will find that we will um, expand the use of uh, uh, CCS even more uh, in the future. So for for the next year, I would say that we plan to, in, to integrate it in about 60% of our research projects. And I don't just mean uh, formal research projects or big scale research projects, but even in the design of our next actions and initiatives, I can see so many ways that we can integrate uh, citizen social science. And this, the influence that this project has had to our organization was not just informational or instructional of course the um, you know the guidance you offered us I, I i i talked about that before the guidance was very important but equally important was the infrastructure we started creating within the greek and cypriot ecosystem because if it took an effort of eight to create this consortium in the first place uh, in our next steps, we will need an effort or, or four or five to, you know, uh, call these people back again or expand the consortium or change the consortium depending on the needs of the project. So it's like we have been gaining uh, experience and momentum through this this experience, uh, and and I believe this will only uh, be scaled and not you know uh restricted in the future so thank you for that brilliant so um using uh citizen social science method that sort of an infrastructure to uh, be reused across projects uh really really interesting thank you um so i would like to jump to uh founder and to uh, talk about to continue talking about this question of added value um so being a community-based organization, uh, you are to some extent already expected to be close to the needs of your community and to talk to them regularly, especially Founderland, which was really born out of like this, um, this community talking to each other about their, their own uh, the, the, the shared challenges. There's no differentiation between uh, the people in Founderland, the people around Founderland to some extent. Um, so, um, what do you, what would you say is the actual added value uh, that citizen social science brings to an organization like yours, which has already this starting point of being close to the community? Yeah, of course. Um, so, I think when you when you start off in general with an organization like Founderland, you of course, like you said, you assume that you're already really close to your community because everyone that's in your community is there because of a common cause, common play, because of the similarities in this background. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to remember that it's a it's still not a homogenous group all the time. Everyone has their individual experience and background. It's very heterogeneous in that sense. And so because of that, citizen social science was actually extremely important for us to gain different perspectives on an issue. Right. The, the reasons why someone would go into taking an entrepreneurial path is, is really drastically different across the board. The types of discrimination that they're facing when they're in their founding journey varies depending on their background because of intersectionality, because it has to do with are you a mother? Are you a migrant? And uh, you're, yeah, we're all women in the organization, but what is your ethnic background? And so all of these things made were drastically different for all of the founders. And so actually, 
citizen social science was actually a good learning for us in the process to see, okay, we thought that there was maybe this group of problems or these group of experiences that the founders are having, but through these conversations and interviews and research, we were actually able to find new insights and new findings that maybe we would not have necessarily come across just off of what we were doing already. So it actually ignited a new conversation for us to have with the community. And it also sparked new potential for us to help solving issues that maybe we would not have initially realized were actually faced by the community. So um, yeah, I would say that was probably one of the biggest added values. And I think also at the same time, it's an extremely important value to the rest of the entrepreneurial ecosystem as a whole, um, because as a group, it's also the research wouldn't have been conducted into this group. And if it was done in a traditional manner, like I mentioned before, we probably wouldn't have gotten those insights either. So citizen social science actually was not only beneficial to Founderland, which is more or less kind of close to the community as is, of course we are close, but still more to learn, but also extremely beneficial to just the ecosystem as a whole, because they are not close to the community at all. So that would be what I said, a really, the real value added to the project. That's a really interesting perspective to think about the, the ecosystem around the organization and not just the organization. Thank you for this. Um, staying on the topic on founded and maybe Stefan, you could share as the mentor and a researcher working closely with founded and throughout this process, uh, what do you think was interesting from your perspective as a researcher in helping founded and acquire those methods and tools and um, sort of research be best practices? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. So I was not the only mentor, it was all as well as Ledura before Daniel Heinz, and um, we enjoyed very much our collaboration. And for me, it was an interesting um, experience to sit in the back seats and to help a little bit by navigating through the jungle of science. And um, so when I, when you address me as a mentor, I think it's too much. So I think you work very self-reliant uh, and very independently. And so you did a great job with your project. And um, so we offered uh, yeah, workshops uh, to explain a little bit more about research methods. And uh, my uh, um, uh, impression was, Janine, that you picked up those things that were interesting, helpful uh, for your planning of your research project. And um, yeah, so I think that was, um, yeah, um, something that we supported you with our knowledge, with our methods, probably with our way of thinking. And, um, um, and the way that I think about citizen science is that I think that, that um, the idealization, so there are two interests in science. Yeah? So the, the classic <clears throat> scientific view on doing science is more the the distance yeah, to everyday uh, towards everyday practices. So normally we are not interested in which way the social action goes. Yeah. So we as an observer, we observe human beings as we observe ants or animals. Yeah. So I make it up a little bit. Yeah. But um, so that's one approach to knowledge and probably to science. And I think that civil society organizations, they have a different approach that is not the scholarly um, um, dist uh, uh, perspective in distance to social practices, but you have goals, yeah? you have stakes in the play, you have interests in what you are doing in your social practices. And so the knowledge that you are interested in is probably more related to, yeah, to help you to get a higher degree of action potency, for example, but probably that, that yeah, that's my perspective on the, the process with the open court. Probably you as CSOs, you have a different perspective on it. And I would be uh, really interested in discussing this um, to learn something new for me as a scientist. But that's the way that I conceptualize it. And, and, and for, for, uh, from the per, uh, scientific pers perspective, it's always important to get in distance 
to the research subject, yeah, to the phenomena under study. And I think that's more tricky some when you are involved in the play, yeah, when you are subjected by power relationships in the field, if you have your own interest, if you if you want to promote emancipatory policies, actions, yeah. Um, so for me, it's easier for my office at my university to look at the world and yeah, to consider every aspect, yeah. But but I think um, that is even important to open up a research process for a CSO to say stop, yeah. Um, that is a different frame that we use now. We use now science, and that is to go a step back from our daily practices or interests that we have in this practices. And we give um, the social phenomena a second view. Uh, and probably we, we learn something new that we didn't knew before. Yeah? And, and, and it, it, it could be um, uh, impeding to open new perspective when I'm too close because I'm, I'm too emotionally involved in these practices. Yeah, but that's my observation with a distant look of an animal researcher who is doing social science. Yeah, and but 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 that would be a really important uh, or interesting point to discuss with you. Can you relate to yourself to my description or my self definition? So what what was it? my uh, interest or um, what were my goals when I did the mentoring and probably you have totally different view on it. and that would be really interesting for me to hear from you. Thanks. Um, maybe uh, Monchil has an opinion, especially uh, I would say that um, the single step has this particularity of working with a community where um being detached and distant from the community may be uh, counterproductive uh, in the sense that trust is so essential to working uh, with um, LGB, the LGBTI community. So what, is, what are your thoughts, Monsieur? Thank you, Cedric. Indeed, um, people living in, in rural areas have a certain type of di uh, difficulties. But as we have a couple of other members of our team here, I would like to uh, pass on this question to uh, my colleague uh, Vasilena, who's been actively coordinating this, uh, this initiative, so she can uh, express her take on, on this question. Thank you, Monchil. Thank you very much for having me today. I'd just like to mention here, like Monchil said before, how difficult it can be to work with the LGBTQ community, especially in society like Bulgaria that's very conservative. And what I found from my experience using these methods is that giving up on your research bias in a way and just letting someone else, meaning the co-researchers, do the job, does not only foster new experiences and knowledge for us, um, as a research community, but it also allows us to build on a really strong basis of creating relationships with this community. Because a lot of problems that we have is to actually break through the barrier because these people think that nobody supports them and that, that they're in this really unfavorable situation and actually being able to give them the power to do something and to take part in the citizen social advice in this way helps them feel empowered and it really changes their perspective on things. And this has benefits not only for the research like our results have shown, but it also has a lot of benefits for these people in their future, especially when we think about how they're gonna find a job, how they're gonna have their transition in the future. And it really just builds this resilience that a community like this really needs to survive and thrive. So this is what I think. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to uh, add something to that topic? So um, what I would, um, would like to talk about now is a specific part of the uh, citizen social science uh, cycle, project cycle, as defined by COACT. So we mentioned how um, there are five, step, five steps, and um, we have at the fourth step, the collective 
data analysis and interpretation. And um, it has appeared uh, from the interaction with uh, not only uh, the uh, three NGOs represented here, but also all the research teams that have worked uh, on CSS project through the COACT project, um, that this is a crucial step. This is a crucial step, both uh, in terms of engaging uh, co-researchers, because it can be tricky. Uh, it requires, uh, analyzing data requires a certain level of data literacy. Uh, so there is an element of capacity building, of uh, sharing um, knowledge in anticipation of uh, being able to talk on the uh, on to be on the same uh, page around the data analysis or interpretation. There are some logistical um, uh, concerns about okay. So we do we focus on the just uh, interpreting data with co-researchers? Do we bring them at even earlier when we analyze the raw data? Uh, how do we organize a workshop so that everybody can be involved and everybody understand and think? about the data as a researcher. So um, this is a this is um, one of the trickiest parts of uh, delivering a, a CSS project, a citizen social science project. And that has proven true as well for uh, each of um, the civic organizations that were um, involved and that are present here. So maybe we can start with uh, Foundonen. So um, how did the collective data analysis go for you? What were the challenges um, that you faced, and um, what 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 is your takeaway from this process? Is it something that you found uh, useful? Uh, is it something that um, you're still not sure if that's you would be able to replicate it in the future? What are your your thoughts on this part of the process? Mm -hmm. um... Specifically, I, well, I guess I'll start in general with maybe what were more the general challenges with working with the co-researchers. Um, and I think the first thing would be getting the commitment across the board from all of them because they were founders from within our community. They also were working on their own businesses at the same time. And so that was already sometimes a time commitment, which often led to the next issue in the process, which was quality assurance, because we did have them conducting the interviews as well. The standard to which they conducted the interviews, although we did create a very good interview guideline and questions and process for that, what exactly would happen in the interviews, of course, is up to whatever happens in the situation, how the conversation goes. So there, there was, of course, then um, a quality assurance aspect of it, where ensuring the consistency across the results was also a bit challenging or the types of questions asked or the way the question was asked. And then, of course, then to that step that we're currently referring to, um, you also had to be aware of bias, right? And I think Stefan kind of made an interesting mention of it because it is a social, citizen social science project and everyone from the community or the people conducting the research are people who are afflicted with the same issues that are currently being researched. There you do have to sometimes take a step back and remove yourself from the research a bit to objectively look at it and say, okay, is this interpretation bias? Like if I read the entire context of the conversation, was this truly what the person was meaning with what they said? Um, and so that really took a proper method <laughs> to make sure that we were trying our best to avoid any biases in the outcome of the research, which meant each of the people who conducted an interview went through themselves and coded it. But then I also independently, because I didn't do the interviews, went through and coded it. And then again, as a group, we all went through again and coded it. And in that process, we did notice that there were differences sometimes in what we thought that code actually represented. Um, so it definitely um, presented a little bit of a challenge for that particular step across the board. Um, but we did really try our best to <laughs> alleviate any biases that may have come across at that particular point by doing that. And then in addition to the codes that we found in that three-step process that we had for it, we also did go back again and do more secondary research so that we were able to then take that 
and compare it to what we found and say, okay, is this debunking what we've said, contradicting it anyway? Is this actually proving and validating what we found in our research as well? And so in that way that we were just able to kind of give it more of the scientific backing behind it as well. So I do think that it's definitely repl replicable in the future as well for other groups. And I think that kind of what Stefan said, having that mindset to realize that we all have to step out of being in the shoes of the person who was interviewed and being very objective about it and kind of being that academic researcher who maybe has no context about this and just taking it for what it is, is a bit really important to do. But yeah, I see Stefan's hand is up, so. <laughs> Yes, Stephanie, you want to add something? Yeah, can I add something? Yeah, so I'm biased as you, as everyone, as every human being. So the only thing is that is my bias is, is, is a different one, yeah? And uh, I don't think that there's a, a solution. So, and, uh, so uh, I don't have the more objective perspective on that, yeah? But, but the methods helps. And theory says, and so, so I think my job is not to have the better knowledge or the better methods, yeah, but um, it's uh, just to help to use my uh, or to to give my knowledge to you. who are probably not doing everyday <laughs> science and read all the stuff that I read, yeah. Um, but yes, and and um, yeah, but and, and I think both sides are important for social research topics. Yeah, there's always an interest in play, and that I'm doing in social science. Yes, of course, that's not objective selection of research uh, topics, but but I think that is really important that we have a democratic society, that we have strong civil society organizations, and so I think that is important. <clears throat> Uh, uh, to, to support this and to be engaged in this process as a researcher again. Yeah? And uh, so thanks, Janine, thanks to Fauneland for this really cool experience that we had the last 10 months. Or... Um, while I have you, Stefan, um, what another interesting question is um, your work that you have done with Founder and where you insisted that you were in the back seat, that you were mostly sort of sharing your experience. Um, so is it something that you think is replicable very easily with all types of civic organizations? Or is there something specific about Founderland or about the type of organization we've been working with uh, that makes them more uh, conducive to adopting uh, CSS methods, in your opinion? How do you see um, this initial sort of um, attempt as um, putting civic organization at the helm of CSS? How do you see that spreading to a broader um, broader range of organization? Is, is that is that going to be difficult? Is that uh, mostly for specific organizations? What's your view on this? Mm -hmm. Yes, for me, uh, science is curiosity. So in German, we have the word forschen, to be forced, so to be interested in what happens outside there. I think that is something that every human being can have. Um, but but uh, we discussed it here before, yeah? So um, uh, one uh, hurdle is, I think, the, that that in our case we have three organizations they are highly academic yeah and i think an open question to extend since social science is how we can lower the threshold to participate in these projects even to people who doesn't have such an academic education as a background to participate in this project yeah i think then we have um, a different translation process or yeah Think that uh, yeah, that this is a really challenge, and that probably we we, have, we should and we have to uh, develop solutions to you know, this challenge. In, if, if we want to take the the aspect of participation and co-design and uh, uh, integration, um, if we want to take it serious. Thank you. 
Um, so coming back to that question of uh, collective data analysis and and um, just to um, just to be very transparent, um, my team has been working in partnership with the rest of the co uh, coalition on a white paper to uh, sort of summarize um, the, the experience we've had working with Founderland, Single Step, and Women on Top. And, and we found collective data analysis as a, a sort of very uh, key point in the process uh, from the uh, interaction we had with um, these uh, NGOs. And so, um, Stella, uh, could you could you tell us about your experience uh, with collective data analysis? How how did it work? Uh, what, uh, how many workshops did you organize? How did you select who should be part of it? Um, and what were the benefits in your opinion? Um, thank you, Cedric. Let me uh, start by saying that this was the part that uh, mostly terrified uh, the team internally because we haven't we hadn't done anything like that before, and because in our minds data analysis was something very technical that should be, uh, you know, uh, concentrated in the hands and heads of a very small team of experts. So. This was a process that we, uh, I think we felt we couldn't approach and it really helped that uh, uh, you guided the workshop before, you know, the actual um, analysis happened and this gave us some great tools uh, we could use without our co-researchers so I, I, I dare to say we just decided to to dive in and see what <laughs> what happens. Um, that said, we uh, chose because we didn't have any data analysis experts in the core researchers consortium, uh, we decided to engage our um, our partners, uh, our research partners, uh, a social uh, research firm in in Greece. Uh, so we asked. Uh, we gave them the data, they conducted the analysis and they created some tables for us and we asked the, the senior researcher to join us in the workshop we organized uh, to help, you know, um, answer any questions we couldn't ask or run any analysis that needed running uh, during the workshop. Uh, so what we did, we ran a three hour workshop and we had a uh, 12 of our 20 um, consortium members joining in. So because we were um, um, exploring four different pillars, four different questions, let's say, um, we split into four teams and each team had to analyze the set of data, the set of tables that corresponded to each pillar. So we divided the teams in such a way where uh, each co-researcher would join the group um, that their expertise um, correspond where their expertise uh, corresponded with. So, for example, we had um, an organization working with single mothers um, who joined the group uh, working on the work-life balance question because we thought they would have you know, more to say about the challenges that single mother face uh, in with regards to, to work-life balance. So the, the surprise for me was, uh, two surprises. One was how easy this process was. The second was how fruitful this, this process was because we had some very specific uh, material to work on and it was much easier for our core researchers to uh, express their opinions and to actually have an opinion and to form an opinion because they had the data in front of them. So the numbers stimulated their own thoughts and these thoughts were combined with their experiences. And we had some very interesting input from, from everyone, I would say, um, regarding those data. Uh, so. It was an amazing experience for me. I, I must say is the part of the process that I am more looking forward to replicating again. And, and, and it was the one that I, I would find the hardest before. So thank you. 
this is uh, great to hear. Um, so I would like to ask the same question to uh, the single step team uh, to share your experience about um, delivering this kind of workshop that you may have, um, you were very confident entering them, you were uh, probably a bit less afraid than uh, still esteem. Um, but uh, did you gain some insights from this process? And um, I, an additional question would be, um, how do you, uh, do you see this contributing to your advocacy in a, a meaningful way? Um, coming from this four step to the five step, is the transition for you um, easy? Thank you, Cedric. Indeed, uh, the focus groups uh, that we organized following the uh, data collection were very much valuable, and that supports with um, real world information, our advocacy efforts. But I would like to invite here another one of our uh, of uh, team members, also with a research background, Maria, who is um, doing research in health. Uh, psychology to elaborate a little further on the uh, focus group discussions and uh, analysis of the uh, information coming from that, Maria. Thank you, Monty. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yes, sure yes. can. Yes. Um, well, yes, what we did was, um, since our data was quite complex and needed to be analyzed with a special software, um, Montiel and the statistician took uh, that first step. However, once we had uh, the data, or at least in a raw form, we presented it at our um, second focus group with uh, our co-researchers and some community members. So. We discussed the findings, um, asked them their opinions on them, as well as um, what their expectations about some more complex analysis would be. For example, if they believed that um, certain items and variables would differ according to whether the person was trans or non-binary or a trans man or a trans woman. And it was very interesting to hear what their expectations in terms of that were, or what their um, their interpretations of some of our initial findings were, and what they believed the reasons to be um, behind some of our findings. So it just really helped um, to kind of fill up the numbers that we had with uh, the real experiences of also the people who took uh, a part in the questionnaire because um, they had also, of course, participated in it or helped us create it. So that just gave another dimension to the data we had um, and was extremely useful to us. Thank you. And how does that process uh, sort of help you transition towards maybe a better or a different uh, advocacy uh, actions? Maybe I can take over on the advoc advocacy actions um, as I'm personally involved with this part. Um, indeed, institutions always like to see numbers and they believe numbers, exact data, but numbers are not as meaningful as um, uh, unless they have some story to it. So by having the focus groups and direct conversations with community members and co-researchers, we're able to add a, a story to the numbers. And when we give the numbers a real face, that has a stronger impact when we discuss the matters with uh, representatives of institutions, doctors, employers, and definitely it makes a difference to have that component. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting to to hear. Um, maybe uh, the same question could be um, applied to Founderland and um, Women on Top. How does the transition from um, the collective data analysis, and we heard your uh, how it happened for you and how useful that was for you, how do you make the transition to um, uh, basically doing advocacy either uh, the more more than uh, a 
different type of advocacy than you were doing before or simply enriching your existing advocacy activities so how does the transition uh work yanina for example mm -hmm. i think that's a, a really great question because that's currently the point that we're really in right now um for founderland the research acted or served also as a proof point for why our organization exists to begin with. Um, as mentioned before, there's a significant lack of research in this field. What we do know, according to the research and the statistics, that women of color entrepreneurs are significantly underfunded. Why are they underfunded? What is the status of the ecosystem? What is going on? Why is this happening? It wasn't really there. What are the experiences of these founders? No information on that. And so our research really acts as sort of a foundation now for us to say, hey, we know that these are the stats. Now, look, we have the reasons why. Um, and this is really helpful to us now as we kind of move forward, because through the research, we also identified three main target audiences or three main ecosystem players that are important for us to address to be able to make a proper change, which is government entities, the investors themselves, allies, and then even just the founder community as a whole. And so because of that, we are able to kind of tailor the research and the findings that we found to each of those target audiences to be able to make a proper change. And so that means for us now creating programs and workshops that support the founding founders groups but also serving investors with opportunities to figure out ways to go through unconscious bias training for example or to government entities as to why it's important to fix this issue to begin with and how it has a significant Im impact on the german economy especially in the long term um and so that takes on a, a myriad of ways like i said workshops but also at the same time hosting events and networking uh, conversations or even just having really um, important panel discussions with key ecosystem players. So um, yeah, it's it's really important for the way forward for the organization. As I said, it set up a really important foundation. And that's also why we do plan on continuing to do this research on an annual basis, if possible, so that we're able to continue to build upon it because it's just really just scratched the surface. Um, it's just the tip of the iceberg and we still need to uncover the entire <laughs> iceberg um, and in doing so, of course, get attracting the right people. So that's what I would say for right now. Thank you for your comments. Um, Stefan, you wanted to add something? Yeah, could I add here? So um, uh, what is research? Uh, it is a withdrawal out of social practices to have the second look and to get new insights and to, to gather new knowledge yeah and that needs resources yeah? and that's so important that it becomes quite more come for funding agencies bodies that that they include these open call uh, funding into their calls when they want to um, have uh, citizen science or participatory research and um, that needs resources yeah so uh, i think everyone every human being enjoys to have a look in, a second look but normally we don't have these resources when we do our uh, daily action in our social practices so funding is a really important issue and i think that those projects so especially in the case of founderland so what janine and your team accomplished yeah uh, so you were underfunded, I would say, and uh, it was really restricted. And, uh, uh, and, uh, so I wish for the future yeah, that that uh, as a co-researchers, we call you co-researchers in, in the social science project, get adequate funding for the tasks that they achieved in their projects, and they achieved a lot in these projects. It is interesting, uh, the funding situation is interesting because it's, uh, of course, not the same funding channels when you are an academic uh, team trying to get a citizen uh, social science research funded versus being a civic organization trying to convince a funder that um, the sort of additional legwork to include the co-researchers uh, to have them through the process will uh, generate value and, 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 um, and sort of justifies uh, maybe the additional uh, resource that you're asking, and so that's um, that's definitely a question that um, we we have to uh, 
um, look at in the future uh, when thinking about uh, replicating this um, this experiment. Um, Stella, you wanted to intervene. Yes, thank you, Cedric. I would like to echo what uh, Janine said about the need to, you know, uh, continue and update this uh, this research. And I think this is the most frustrating and the most inspirational part of the research. Uh, in any case, um, but I wanted to share an example. Um, uh, answering to to your question about how you move from the data analysis to advocacy, um, one of the of the research questions we were all had set uh, out to answer was about um, uh, cybersecurity in terms of sexual harassment in uh, in remote working. And uh, within our consortium, we worked with a small organization in Greece, based in Greece uh, called DataWo, uh, who are concerned with um, with digital sexual harassment and uh, and and cyber harassment in general um, in the workplace and in the public sphere. So. Data were very engaged in in our uh, research process. They took part in all of our workshops and in the uh, data analysis uh, process. And afterwards, after our last workshop, where we shared, uh, you know, our report and and we gathered their ideas about dissemination, etc., we decided to apply uh, collectively with Data War. Uh, for a new grant to raise awareness and educate uh, tech and AI professionals who um, create projects uh, and, and, and tech products for uh, to be used by uh, companies and organizations uh, for um, uh, in the scope of remote working on how to design and create more gender responsive programs that uh, ensure the safety uh, of, of everyone who uses them. So we have been applying for new grants to, you know, to conduct this, this, this project. And I think this has been a, a great example of, of, you know, the next steps that this kind of collaboration can lead up to. Um, so, because this is a very recent uh, development, and, and I didn't have the chance to share it with either uh, Carol or, or the rest of the team, I think it's um, it's it's a great thing to see how uh, this research gets legs and and keeps working, even after you know it's finished. Fantastic! Um, this is uh, this is great to know uh, that you know, there is. Uh... There are some some actual uh, outcomes out of this work, uh, even though it was short, even though it was uh, an experiment, and we weren't sure of the results. But um, this is brilliant. Um, so we are. Um, this uh, roundtable is coming to an end, and um, I would like to finish with a, a question for everyone, a simple question, which is that um, if you were to uh, deliver a similar uh, citizen social science uh, project in, in the future, uh, what would you change, what you would you improve based on the learnings of this 10-month project and what you stumbled on, what is the one thing uh, that you would like to do better next time? Maybe Stella's first. I'm sorry, Cedric, I lost my connection for a minute there. Can you repeat the question for me? Uh, so if you if you have a new project, a citizen social science project with a similar similar format than what you've uh, been through uh, during uh, the past 10 months, uh, what would be the one thing that you would like to do better to improve uh, now that you, you've been through it once? Great. Uh, thank you. So we do have uh, a project indeed. Uh, for next year, uh, beginning in January 2023. And uh, we want to explore the um, professional and educational needs and challenges of women in the Greek countryside and uh, the Greek islands. So this is a project that, because Greece is a very, um, how can I say that in English? It has many small places scattered apart with no great uh, connection networks between them. So this is the kind of research that we cannot, uh, we cannot do it the traditional way. Uh, we would need to employ the CCS principles anyway, 
but now that we know that this is what we are going to do, we're going to do it much better than we would uh, two years ago uh, without knowing the specifics. So we are going to engage with local stakeholders in each place we want to visit and to explore, and we will uh, leverage their networks in order to get in touch with the women themselves and talk with the women directly rather than conduct conducting a big scale online questionnaire or you know sending out um, third party researchers uh, to do that work for us. So it will take more times more time and now that we know that we will um, integrate this need in our budget uh, so we will be able to support the whole process better. Um, and and also the, the second thing that we did uh, because of what we learned from from the co project was that we asked for the collaboration and the support of um, an academic researcher who will be you know our academic consultant in this project. Uh, so because we won't have the statistical analysis power of our uh, recent uh, research partner, we will uh, have the academic uh, expertise uh, of our consultant. So this is a very exciting project for us. We hope we will find the budget to implement it in 2023 and maybe a bit of 2024. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Um, single step. Uh, what would be your answer to my question? Okay, so Cedric, I'll take over for this question, if you don't mind. Um, like you said in the beginning, our research phase featured around 100 responses from the trans and non-binary community, which might not seem like a lot, but we hope that if we were to redo this project, we could have um, actually use our networks more wisely to reach a wider audience. Um, just like in Greece, in Bulgaria, you also have a lot of LGBTQI folks that's in the rural areas. So it was quite difficult to reach these people, especially with our network. So we would have really invested more time and efforts into fostering um, more trust in the community so that we could actually get higher numbers. Uh, but for the very first study in trans and non-binary rights and their access to the labor market, I think we've done not so bad, but definitely we would be looking to implement like a higher subject count for future, um, for future projects. Fantastic. Thank you. And we will leave the last word to uh, founder and Nina about um, if we were to do it again. Again, uh, what would be the, the first thing to uh, try to do better? Yeah, um, so we are definitely planning on doing it again, um, as I've mentioned a bit earlier. Um, what we would want to do differently the next time is, of course, ex expand the interview groups as a whole, um, but also at the same time, expanding the scope. So kind of this time we mainly focus on a, quali a qualitative research approach, mainly just doing interviews. We want to switch that into a, both a qualitative and a quantitative research approach to be able to increase the scope and the span. So we're understanding the what and the why this time, because now we understand what the experiences of the founders are like, but now we can start asking new questions and different questions, which would then require both sides of the research to be conducted, but also at the same time, expanding the groups that we're interviewing as well. So this time we really focused on founders themselves, but now opening it up to the wider ecosystem and looking into the investor perspectives and looking into the government perspectives to really start getting more of these like holistic 360 approach. And then when it comes down to the research itself, um, I think it was a really, big learning process for us, a very steep learning curve for us. And so now that we have done this process, we have a very clear understanding of the types of roles and the types of responsibilities that are needed for this research. And we're going to be very clear about defining that to each group in the future. So what exactly do we expect from the co-researchers? What exactly are we expecting from the lead researcher? Because we didn't really know this the first time. We didn't even understand what really the report itself entailed what kind of elements were needed. So um, 
in relation to that as well, which would be the other next thing that we would also do differently is creating a really a proper structure and a timeline for approaching the research in the future, because now we have a proper understanding of approximately how long these things take, what roles and responsibilities, what kinds of tasks have to be created. So those would just be the main things that we would do differently and also add to in the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your contribution and for the feedback from all participants and invited NGOs. So um, that was um, a small round table for us to get a sense of what it means uh, for um, civic organizations to try to uh, embed civic um, CSS methods uh, in their work. Um, so as you could see the, the experience varied depending on where they were coming from in terms of research expertise, in terms of um, the, the size of their um, stakeholder group. And um, that means that uh, a lot more research is needed for us to understand uh, what are the tools and methods that uh, match the best uh, uh, this or that organization, because the, the civic sphere is very large with a lot of different organizations. Uh, but what we what we can conclude is that uh, unanimously um, there is there are positive outcomes that uh, come from um, working with um, uh, in including CSS methods in uh, the work of civic organizations. So this is definitely something to be explored further in the future. So thank you everyone who attended and who um, thank you especially to the participants who contributed their uh, uh, knowledge, experience, and give the feedback to uh, this audience and to anyone watching this video afterwards. Um, we uh, will now uh, end this roundtable and uh, we are looking forward to having you continue follow um, the uh, event, this final event that COAP is organizing to conclude these three years of research. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.